All right, welcome everyone to our inaugural intermet.digital webinar. Today's topic is how to start a weather business. The first in a planned series of webinars exploring business opportunities for addressing the impacts of weather and climate change. I'm your host, Dr. Sheldon Drobot, and by day I work on strategy and technology growth for L3 Hair Space Systems. Today we welcome two expert panelists who can help you in your quest to start a weather business. Dr. Jan Dutton of Prescient Weather and Alan Richards of West Hill Capital. Each panelist will give a brief presentation about what they do and when they've all finished, we'll move on to a panel discussion and audience Q and A. We had some questions in advance, but we're hoping that you and the audience are thirsty for knowledge and we look forward to receiving your questions via our Zoom Q and A. We'll be looking at these questions once our experts have finished their presentations. And one final word before we start. While we're sure you're gonna learn much from what our expert panelists have to share, please bear with us if there are any technical glitches. So without further ado, let me introduce our first expert, Dr. Jan Dutton. Jan has a background in the science of climate variability, but flipped to the dark side after graduating with his PhD and has worked in the commercial weather industry for the past 20 years. He is currently the CEO of Preston Weather, a provider of advanced climate information services to enable high value decision making. Jan, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Sheldon. And thanks everyone for uh, taking the time to uh, attend the, the webinar. Um, been looking forward to it. And I look forward to the questions at the end. So today uh, we're talking about starting a, a weather business. And so just a little bit of background on myself, uh, as Sheldon said, uh, I, uh, I did a PhD in, in meteorology at Penn State University. And at the same time, I actually also did a, an MBA, a master's of business administration. And I did that because uh, while I was fascinated by the science, um, I knew I wanted to work on in the commercial side of, of the world rather than the academic or, or the government side. And so just um, a little bit of background then, when I graduated school, uh, I started a small company called Weather Ventures. And uh, the role of Weather Ventures at the time was to integrate climate forecast information to help price weather derivatives. Uh, and uh, we created a tool, we had a couple of customers. And then uh, at the time, the, the Enron, uh, Enron, that large energy company in the US imploded on itself and the, the weather derivatives market sort of disappeared for a while, unfortunately, and that company died. Uh, and then I, I joined Weatherbug, which at the time was a relatively small uh, weather information startup based in the United States. And while there, I had a number of roles, I was, uh, but they were primarily, I was a product manager and then a sales manager. Uh, and so Weatherbug today is known as, as Earth Networks. Um, and I really, I had a wide range of experiences there that were, that uh, really helped sort of define uh, what I do to today. I left Earth Networks and joined another startup. So this was a New York Bay backed, New York venture capital backed startup, again, focused on, on weather risk. Um, and so we're now in uh, the second major economic downturn of my career and Storm Exchange died with the first economic downturn in, uh, in 2008 to 2009. But fortunately, I had the opportunity uh, upon uh, leaving Storm to join DTN. So DTN today is one of the largest, uh, well, they claim now they're the largest weather information company in the world. Uh, and I spent a good chunk of time there running a team that was uh, globally oriented uh, that sold high-end airport weather observation systems. So that gave me a great set of experiences and background to, uh, to join what is today called Prescient Weather. So again, Prescient Weather is a small team. Uh, and interestingly, one of the founders is my father, uh, who was, uh, he was a professor of meteorology at, at Penn State for uh, a number of years. And so at Prescient Weather, we have two primary products that are both climate information focused. One is called Crop Profit. Uh, and so Crop Profit is uh, it's a corn and soybean yield forecasting system. You can think of it as that we quantify the impact that weather has on crops. And then the World Climate Service is a tool set that is designed to enable climate analysis, monitoring, and forecasting. And it's a, I like to say it's a one-stop shop for long-range forecasting. Um, so that's a little bit of background. And I guess if, uh, if one thing that I wanted to communicate to the folks on the, on the webinar who are considering starting a, a weather business, 
you know, I think it's, it's understood probably, but not necessary. Uh, certainly that technical skills in meteorology or climatology or oceanography are really uh, important. Uh, but certainly there are companies that, that are started in the space where the, the founder is not necessarily a, a meteorologist, but knows where to find them. Uh, and then as part of that training, usually you end up uh, learning programming, say in Python. Python is the language uh, that most folks are learning to today, but certainly R or, or other languages as well. But really to be successful, uh, you really have to consider uh, other skill sets as well. And, you know, it's everything required to run a business. And I'm making an assumption that it's going to start as a relatively small op operation. Uh, and so to be able to do that, you have to have some information and knowledge around marketing and sales and product management. So really, which is to say like the science is necessary, but it's not sufficient to generate success within the business. And so if there are folks that are still in school, uh, and uh, you have the opportunity to take some business oriented classes outside your science, I highly recommend it. Um, and it's kind of, uh, to some it may be a slightly mind bending experience, but it's really good if, if you're planning on, on starting a, a business. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples that, uh, that I've learned really in the last couple of years. So when, uh, when I started at Pressing Weather in May of 2018, uh, the marketing budget was essentially zero dollars, and, and I had to figure out how to get our message out uh, in a cost-effective manner. And I, I turned to two things. One is Twitter, and the other is search engine optimization. And so Twitter is a great platform because there's, there's a lot of people, and there are, if you dig hard enough, you can find the folks that are you know, interested in whatever niche that, that you play. Um, so we focus uh, on crop profit on both uh, what's called ag Twitter, uh, and then weather Twitter as, as well. And so using Twitter, uh, we came up with a strategy of developing unique and interesting content that uh, sort of is only supported by, by our tool set. Uh, we could write a blog that is an analysis, uh, sorry, we could write a blog post that is an analysis of a particular topic. Uh, we would tweet about it um, to get people to visit our blog post. And on that blog post, there was what's called a call to action. And that call to action is take a trial uh, people fill out that form, and then we we engage uh, with the individual. Uh, they learn about the product, we learn about them, and hopefully uh, the process en ends up with, with a sale. But I will say this was uh, this was a totally new experience to me, and um, three years later now, I'm still. Uh, I actually was just doing some analysis, trying to figure out uh, what parameters create the most successful tweets, like what tweets get the most visibility based on the parameters of the of the information. So again, this is a skill set that up till uh, a few years ago, I didn't even know that I needed to have, uh, but the logical conclusion of figuring out how to market a product with zero dollars was I had, to, I had to start using Twitter marketing tactics. So the, the other tactic for, from a marketing perspective that we use is, uh, is search engine optimization. So what I have here uh, on the left-hand side is a list of keywords that I've conveniently uh, grayed out so that no one knows my strategy for keywords. But on, then on the left-hand side is our, is our Google search engine result page uh, rankings. So we see there's an awful lot of number ones there. And what that means is if you search in Google for a key term uh, that I have sort of researched and analyzed that makes sense, uh, our link will show up first. And uh, it's something like 63% of the traffic on Google goes to the first link, 23% uh, goes to the second link, 10% uh, goes to the third link and so on and, and so forth. So being in the top three of the Google rankings is really cr critical. And there is a lot of companies that are using search engine optimization to, uh, uh, to, to drive visibility of their, of their pr product. And what is underneath there then is, is a chart that just shows the, uh, the traffic to, to our website um, over time. And so at the beginning, basically there was no search search engine optimization. And as I've learned about it and gotten better at it, uh, I've been able to drive traffic uh, to, our, to our website, in which we're building brand, we're gaining new, new trials and, and new customers of, of the overall prop product. Um, so again, uh, the key here is that uh, the science is really important, but there's an awful lot of other things that are also important. If you have the opportunity to, to gain some experience, uh, uh, I highly re recommend do, doing it. 
So then finally, I'm just going to end uh, on some thoughts around funding of, of business. Uh, and so, you know, when you're starting a business, it generally speaking uh, takes money to be able to, to, to execute the business, whether it's hosting servers or, you know, uh, uh, well, prior to COVID, booking travel to, to, to visit customers and things like that. And so the question is, uh, how might you gain some funding for your business? So there's a couple of opportunities. Uh, that include an equity investment, uh, which is what Alan might talk about. Um, you might take a loan. You might try to find grants uh, from governments or non-governmental organizations. You might get. Uh, you might seek equity funding from friends and family. There's the potential for trade buyouts, and then that, that there's crowdsourced. So I'm just going to talk about a few things to consider based on my own experience over a number of, of different co companies. So the first one is, is equity investment. Um, and so I'll just say, if like, if you have a great idea, a great business plan, and you can demonstrate that you're gonna be able to manage, uh, manage the, the business, you have the opportunity to gain some equity investment. Uh, and the, in the market today, it's generally done by, by venture capital funds. And so the weakness of this approach is the, depending on the stage you're at in your business, you may have to give up control, uh, meaning, um, uh, meaning you may not be calling all of the shots uh, over the long run of the development in, in your business. What you get in return though, is capital to fund your idea, to grow your business uh, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully be, be successful over the long time, over the long term. The strength of that is that you quickly can gain scale, right? So if you can, if you can raise money, uh, you, know, you can hire people that have the skill sets necessary to execute the business. And those skill sets are the skill sets that I talked about just a, a few mi minutes ago. So like in our company right now, we have an awful lot of generalists and we are getting to the point where we're gonna need some, some specific skill sets. There are opportunities for grants. So for example, in the United States, there uh, many of the, the federal agencies have what are called Small Business Innovation Research Grants, so SBIRs. And SBIRs are the federal government's attempt to fund uh, high-risk research at technological companies, but with the goal of, of commercialization. And it's a fantastic source of capital if you can win them because uh, you do not uh, have to give up any equity. It's not a loan, it's a grant. It funds research and then it gives you the opportunity to, uh, to, to commercialize them. And then finally, uh, I'll just mention, for instance, friends and family. So usually the normal course would be that you fund, a, you start a company, you prove that it's going to be, uh, that it has some merit. You might go to friends and family to, to raise some money. So the weakness is that you're going to make a commitment to your friends and family uh, that there is a business op opportunity. Uh, and it's a, you know, I am sure there have friend, been friendships that have been destroyed over an investment on a friends and family basis that didn't turn out su successful. The strength of it then is also your commitment, which is you're now taking your friends and family money and trying to, to be successful. And it is a has the potential anyway to be a highly motivating factor uh, in, in your success that you will probably work more hours because you do not want to uh, get on the bad side of your friends and, and on your family. So I will say that, you know, I hope everyone uh, listening in has, has a great idea to, to start a business but you do want to consider uh, some of the pathways by which you'll be able to grow and make that business successful as well. And so that is, that's all I have to say. And I, again, I'll thank everyone for attending and Sheldon, why don't you take it away? All right. Thanks, Jan, for those great expert insights. I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions. And I'd like to point out that at the bottom of the Zoom panel, there is a Q&A kind of icon there. So if you have questions, please click on that and enter the questions. So now I'd like to introduce our next expert, Alan Richards, and he's important because he's the guy that has money you need to start a business. Alan has more than 30 years experience in investment analysis, corporate finance, and venture capital with companies including Barclays, HSBC, and Maple Securities before co-founding West Hill in 2003. West Hill invests around 60 million pounds annually in early stage companies across a range of sectors, including software, digital platforms, fintech, clean tech, med tech, and bio industrial. So Alan, over to you. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. 
uh, Jan briefly run through the various funding sources uh, available to startups. Uh, in this presentation, I'll focus on how to raise equity capital. First, a few words about West Hill Capital, uh, which has raised 220 million for 35 companies since 2014, um, including 60 million in 2020. So we've been busy right through the pandemic. Uh, we focus on technology companies and we source deals from the partners' networks, uh, including university spin outs, corporate incubators, and repeat entrepreneurs. Uh, we invest at seed stage and all the growth stages. Um, we syndicate each investment with a captive network of about 1,000 high net worth investors. And most investments qualify for the UK's enterprise investment scheme, uh, which gives a range of tax reliefs to investors in early stage companies. Raising capital is hard work um, and investors are very selective. There are many more business ideas than there is capital available. Uh, and investors will apply a range of filters to weed out the weaker propositions. You can look yourselves at the investors' websites and see what those filters are, but they are typically investment sector, investment stage, and the experience of the uh, investment uh, professionals in the team. At West Hill, we receive about one new inquiry per working day. Um, and on average, we backed five new companies a year. So the probability of success um, is around 2%. Um, and I've seen much lower figures than that for um, other VCs. Now, the investor universe is huge. Uh, the financial um, database pitch book tracks over 3 million companies and over 300,000 investors, uh, including 79,000 venture capital investors globally. Uh, within the VC investor grouping, there are about 45,000 angels, um, individuals and groups, 8,000 incubators, uh, 25,000 VC firms, and about 1,000 corporate venturing firms. Successful entrepreneurs may spend around half of their time raising capital. Um, as soon as the ink is dry on one round of investment documents, they're preparing this pitch for the next round. So how do you prepare yourself for this marathon? What are investors looking for? And will they even invest in a weather business? Fortunately, the business of weather is large and growing. And that's two boxes that are ticked for investors. Researchermarkets.com estimates a market for weather forecasting systems of over $5 billion by 2024, growing at an annual rate of 9%. Furthermore, um, VCs have been investing in weather businesses. Uh, taking the period 2015 to 2020, PitchBook has tracked total investment of £517 million in weather forecasting and weather information businesses. And that's invested in 94 companies by over 300 investors. There have been um, 215 deals in, in the same period. Um, with a median deal size of just under 1 million, averaged over all investment stages, that's seed, early stage, and later stage. The most frequent investors in the sector, according to PitchBook, um, as shown on the screen there, um, RRE Ventures is a New York-based VC firm uh, with seven deals, uh, including investments in Spire and Punch App. Plug and Play Tech is a Silicon Valley accelerator with six deals, including Benchmark and Climacell. 
then you have uh, an Israeli angel investor called Ayel Gura, uh, who's a former CEO. And he's made four investments in a company called Taranis. Uh, and similarly, our crowd, which is an Israeli crowdfunding platform, also has four deals in the same company, Taranis. Seraphim Capital is a VC firm based in London, uh, which has invested four times in Spire. And then Canaan Partners um, is a VC, VC firm based in San Francisco with three deals, um, including Climber Cell and Capella Space. So VCs are backing innovative weather businesses, but how does a VC work? The core of a VC firm is the general partner or GP, a firm of seasoned investment professionals who have themselves pitched and raised capital commitments from limited partners or LPs, which will be pension funds, insurance companies, university endowments and family offices. The LPs capital is drawn down and invested um, typically in uh, a fund which has a life of 10 years. Five years of that is in the investment phase and five years is in the realization phase when money is returned back to the investors. And typically the life can be extended by a further two years, making 12 years in, in all. The GP charges annual fees to the LPs uh, of typically 2% of committed capital, which covers the firm's overheads. Uh, and they will also get 20% of the investment profits or carry. The LPs um, typically expect to make three to four times over that 10 year period. Uh, three times would be average, four times would be probably upper quartile. But to achieve that and recognizing that some investments fail and return zero, uh, the, the general partner, the GP, will be targeting returns from each of the investee companies of around 10 times over five years. And that's um, an internal rate of return of 60% per annum. So how did VCs make their 10 times? They'll be looking to invest in businesses which have got scalability, can scale rapidly, preferably globally. And that usually means products, software, platforms, uh, but not professional services. They want to invest in a business which has a deep moat to protect from competition. So that means where possible patents, computer code, and technical know-how. And they like uh, to invest in companies with recurring revenues. So they like subscription models and software as a service. And finally, most importantly, uh, they want companies with a clear route to exit. And often the VCs have, have identified the exit route before even writing out the investment check. Assuming that your business idea has this kind of potential, how should you prepare for a VC investment round? Well, firstly, you should exhaust all opportunities for grants and soft capital from government bodies. In the UK, that's Innovate UK, and in Europe, that would be Horizon 2020, run by the EU. Using soft capital will reduce the percentage shareholding that you need to give away to investors. And it also provides expert third party endorsement of your product. Secondly, you should consider joining an incubator or accelerator to learn from other entrepreneurs and increase your network of mentors and advisors. Thirdly, you should attend some pitch events to see how to pitch and learn from other people's uh, successes and particularly mistakes. Lawyers and accounting firms host regular pitch events, which are normally free. And finally, you should increase your profile, particularly um, on LinkedIn. 
incubators come in many formats. Some are publicly funded by, for example, universities or groups of universities. Uh, and others are more commercial and are run by corporates and investment firms. Incubators are long-term programs that nurture startups through the early phases of the project, including potentially office and co-working spaces. They provide mentorship that allows startups to perform customer discovery, to prototype and develop their product, and to plan out their business, meet potential investors and other entrepreneurs. Most incubators will charge you a fee and some will ask for an equity stake in your company. Uh, you should try and resist that if you can. But they also provide access to discounted fees from lawyers and accountants who are obviously looking to advise the next Google or Amazon. The art of a great pitch depends on being sensitive to your audience and how much time you have. Never run over is, a, is great advice. Master an elevator pitch. Imagine that you meet a, a star VC in a lift and you have 20 seconds to describe your business and get him to take your business card. Prepare a two page teaser, maybe four slides that you can deliver to an audience in three to four minutes. I've listened to plenty of those. And for many of them, even at the end of the, um, the pitch, I still don't know what the product was or how they intended to make money. So try and master that. And finally, you need to prepare a, a perfect pitch deck with your whole business case, uh, typically 20 slides maximum. Check out this website, Pitch Deck Hunt, and see how the famous names have done it. Put yourself in the VC investor's shoes. Would you have invested $500,000 in the angel round of a new concept called Air Bed and Breakfast? You've perfected your pitch, you've made some face-to-face -face presentations and you've interested some investors. Next, you get a term sheet, more than one if you're lucky. This is when you realize that all the cards are stacked in favor of the VC. The VC's investment will be in preferred shares or loan notes. They will rank ahead of management equity. They will not be pari pursue with you. Furthermore, the preferred shares have a coupon which rolls up at eight to 12% per annum. And that eats into your shelving unless you are growing faster than this rate. The money won't appear in your bank account on the day of closing. It will be in tranches which is drawn down against the achievement of certain milestones. The VC will have anti-dilution rights, which means that their percentage shielding is protected against dilution in future investment rounds. In a down round, this will eat into your shielding and those of the other shareholders. On exit, the VC will be the first in the queue to get their money back. And it's sometimes double or treble what they invested before you get anything. They will have preemption rights on share transfers and on future investment rounds, even though they probably won't follow their money. Maybe the fund doesn't have any dry powder, or maybe it's already into the realization phase and therefore there's no new investment forthcoming. As a founder, you will provide warranties about the business potential with a personal monetary guarantee. And if you want to leave the business in the future, you might be treated as a bad lever and have to sell your shares back to the company at nominal value, which leaves you with, or can leave you with nothing. And don't think you're, you're free to run the business as you like. Many decisions will require investor majority consent. And the VC will have board seats or observer seats which means that you probably won't control your own board. Fortunately, the best seeds bring more to the table than just capital. You'll be joining a portfolio of other investee companies that you might be able to learn from or even trade with. You'll be given help to hire the best talent, uh, be advised by seasoned industry veterans, um, 
get assistance to enter new geographic markets and increase your sales and marketing platform. Finally, you'll be on the radar of other investors who might co-invest in your next round. On the radar of strate strategic acquirers looking to buy your business and on the radar of Wall Street bankers looking for the next hot IPO. Thanks for listening and good luck with your business. Uh, I'm now handing back to Sheldon. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. And uh, once again, if you have uh, questions, please be entering them into the Q&A window at the bottom and we'll, uh, we'll get to addressing them here shortly. One last thing before we get to the Q&A though, we had a, a third presenter, Bill Hosek, who was unable to attend today. We have a interview recorded with him from earlier this year that we will make available to the panelists so you can learn a little bit about his uh, his business and, and how he got there. So, all right, on to the questions. The first one comes from uh, John in the audience and it's for, for Jan. What is the most important trend you see in the weather enterprise today? And what would you say this means for potential business startups in the sector? Great. Well, uh, so first let me define what the weather enterprise is. So in the community, in the meteorological or climatological community, the weather enterprise is uh, considered to be the academic, the government and the private sector. Uh, and so as a, as a commercial company, we're a private sector player in, in this overall weather enterprise. So the weather enterprise then, like what are the trends that, that we see? Uh, I, there's actually in parallel this week, there's a, uh, the World Meteorological Organization is hosting uh, five days of discussions that's called the data conference. And um, they are trying to sort through how to make meteorological and climatological data more readily available to the entire, to the entire community. And so there are like countries like in the United States where essentially all of the meteorological data uh, created and measured by, by the government is freely available for anyone to use. Basically, if you know the FTP site, you can, uh, you can go get the data. And then there's other countries where uh, you are, you'll, as a private company, for example, you'll never get your hands on the meteorological data. So I think that one of the trends that we see occurring is that the sort of the, the global weather and climate community is recognizing that this data has the potential to create a lot of value and they're trying to sort through, uh, they're trying to sort through how to make that, that happen. Um, and so in terms of then the potential for, for a business startup, you know, one of the things that I see occurring on a broader scale is there's just incredible amounts of data being made available. And so I, I think there, I would, I'm confident there is no shortage of opportunities to merge a particular data set with a particular cu customer need. And so I, I think that really there's great potential for, for business startups if you are able to um, connect the data and the analysis required of it to solve high value business problems. All right, thanks very much, Jan. So second question is also to you, uh, a little bit more practical for the students perhaps. And, and this question is, what skill set is critical for a meteorology student graduating today? Yeah, so, um, so I end up, I'm a mentor to a couple of undergraduate students that are interested in working in, in the weather industry. And I, I tell them one thing, make sure you graduate knowing Python. It's Python, Python, Python. and. Uh, if you want to start a business, it's likely going to be data related and Python is going to be a critical skill set. Maybe you don't want to start a business, but you still want to work on the commercial side of the industry. Uh, if you have um, if you have skill sets in data management and data analysis, you will be you'll, you'll be pretty well employable. Now, when I say Python, uh, I obviously mean all the other stuff that you normally hear, like being able to communicate and analyze and things like that. Um, that goes without saying, uh, but uh, but certainly skill sets in data analysis and data management are, are critical today. Okay, fantastic. So we, we have a question now for Alan here on, Alan, how important do you think intellectual property is? I know you mentioned a little bit in your talk there, but could you expound on that? Okay, so this is the part of the moat um, which can protect the business against competition um we like to invest in companies uh you know with patents um 
it takes a long time and, and money to uh, to have a patent granted and it takes money to maintain it. Uh, what we find is that universities are very good at um, getting patents and so we often find that the best companies to back are ones or companies that have spun out, out of universities um, with patents already granted. Um, is it a route to riches? No, it's not, uh, because obviously some parts of the world, particularly China, maybe patents aren't, and, and intellectual property isn't as well protected as it is in the, in the US. Um, but if you've got uh, the funds uh, to enter that route and you've got um, funds to, to hire lawyers if you need to, to uh, protect your patents, then it's definitely an advantage uh, in, in uh, being able to gain investment backing. Okay, fantastic. Uh, another question for you, Alan, is, is how do you value a business when you're looking at it? Well, typically, um, you, the company would uh, prepare a set of financial projections, um, maybe over five years. So this will be uh, profit and loss account, cash flow, uh, balance sheet. And normally, uh, as we said, a VC is looking to invest over a five-year period. So the key thing for them will be what's the value of the business um, at the end of the projection period uh, when they're looking to exit. Um, the value of the business at that, at that time obviously will depend on, on what the exit route is, whether it's IPO or whether it's a, a trade sale, or maybe it could be just a sale to another uh, financial investor. So if, if, for instance, we were looking at an IPO of the business, then we'd look at comparable companies uh, listed on the market uh, we'd look how they were valued, uh, look at all the normal investment ratios, such as enterprise value to revenue or enterprise value to, to profits. Um, we'd apply the kind of sector average multiple to the, the profits or the revenue in, 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 in the fifth year of the business. Um, and we'd arrive at an exit valuation um, using that formula. And then to get today's value, then you need to divide by the rate of return you expect to achieve over that period. So if it's 10 times, you divide by 10, and that will be the roughly the value of the business um, at today's date. Um, and then obviously you've got new capital coming in, you can um, divide that by the valuation that you've just uh, arrived at. And that's the amount of uh, shareholding the percentage shareholding that the the investors would expect to get uh, when they're backing it of course not all businesses can raise sufficient capital in one go to last them through to cash flow break even so you'd have to allow for future capital coming in in future rounds which would obviously dilute the investors okay thank thank you very much all right we're going to go back to jan for the next two questions the first is from Oliver in Zambia. So this may have a little bit more of a, an international uh, flair to the answer, I think, Jan. Uh, but the question is, what are some of the organizations where a startup business can apply using a project proposal or concept note for startup funding in the form of a grant? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I have to say, um, Yeah, I don't really know, like certainly specifically to Zambia, I do not know what the answer is. I will say one of the things that I have been tracking is lots of the cloud data companies, uh, lots of the cloud services companies. And I mean, basically uh, Google, Amazon and Microsoft, they do have, uh, they have programs in, um, to support the development of sustainability related technologies. And so if you, if you have an idea related to uh, something related to climate change, for example, you may be able to apply in which you will get a, you'll get a grant that supports the use of their cloud, uh, cloud data processing resources. So I know certainly uh, Amazon Sustainability has a program where they're making their, their cloud computing process facilities available. Uh, and Microsoft has one as well. Microsoft has one that is, uh, Again, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's something like Climate for AI. Um, 
So those aren't grants specifically to start a company, but it certainly is uh, one potential pathway to fund the development or the, the solidification of, of a particular idea. Um, particular to Zambia, again, I would imagine, again, if it's in climate, uh, climate sustainability or adaptation, there may be opportunities uh, to try to, to, to start the business based on, on a sound idea. I, I simply, I don't know where to go to, to start. So unfortunately, I can't quite answer the question completely. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. And, uh, and Oliver, if you have some follow-ups, uh, there'll be an email at the end of the presentation here where you can send some more questions that we could dig into a little bit later. So, so Jan, we'll, we'll stick with you um, here sure. for, for our, our, uh, our next question. And uh, this one uh, comes from, uh, I, I think it's Anupam. I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> saying your name wrong there, but, but Jan, could you please suggest how to choose a core team for the weather startup? Yeah, I guess uh, so. In terms of choosing a core team, in my in one of my slides, I talked about what are the the key skill sets required for success. One was the sort of the technological and the science. Well, one was the science side of things. If you're going to do a, a weather or a climate related uh, startup, and then the other was many of the business functions, sales, marketing, finance, things like that. So uh, when you select your core team, you want to make sure that there is either there's two things you need. You either need people with those skill sets or people who are willing to learn them quickly. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll say my experience in being involved in different startups is, uh, you know, you just have to be willing to try something new, sort through the issues uh, and make decisions and, and move forward. Um, but so I would say ideally the core team would have the skill sets you need. Uh, and if not, you have to have people that, um, that aren't afraid to try new things. All right, that's excellent. Okay, uh, we'll give you a break, Jan. Back to Alan. Uh, we got a question here. To what extent might the ability of a business to tap into private investment funds be influenced by the fact that a project is already receiving some public se sector funding or other support? I think you have to remember that not all uh, VCs and investors are uh, experts. Probably the they might have some PhDs, may not be in the in the same uh, subject as you. Um, so to have um, you know a specialist uh, technologist, perhaps uh, or government body uh, invested, I think is um, an uh, you know an excellent endorsement of of, of your product and your company. So I, I think it's very important indeed. Um, and also the, the, the VC or the investor will be attracted by the fact that um, get, getting access to soft capital in the future also means that um, he will be diluted less in future because less capital will be required from, from other investors in future rounds. So in, in that sense, soft capital is the same as revenue. Uh, the ideal is that you invest. The I ideal is that you invest once, and then the company's, uh, you know, got sufficient revenue or grant uh, income, uh, not to need to raise any further capital. So yeah, it's very important indeed. Okay, here's a kind of current events question for you, Alan. So in terms of future funding opportunities, does it make any difference that Joe Biden is to be our next U.S. president? Or are there other more influential issues that one should consider? Yeah, okay. I mustn't betray any political allegiances here, but um, I've always thought personally that um, if your company needs to get in the government involved, uh, we need to lobby the government uh, to get on in the world, then there's something wrong with you or your business. Um, I've always tried to steer clear of getting involved with lobbying. Um, I suppose the most important thing is the state of the world economy um, and you know, recovering from the pandemic. Will Joe Biden uh, make be better or worse than that than Donald Trump? Um, I don't know, I wouldn't like to say. Sorry, I'm ducking that one a little bit. 
<laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So again, if if the panel or the the, the questioners want some follow up, we'll uh, we'll have that email at the end of the presentation here. Where Sheldon, I can I can jump in on that one. So the, the part of the yeah, question was, sure. are there other things that uh, that may drive opportunity? Uh, I mean, I think certainly one of the things I see occurring is that our changing climate is driving uh, a tremendous amount of opportunities, in particular. Um, because of, uh, of a development called the TFCD, the Task Force on Climate Disclosures, uh, is requiring companies to, uh, to start disclosing what their climate related risks are. There's a whole industry starting up around uh, the support of corporate analysis of climate risks. And, and then below that, then there's a whole, um, there are sub, there are industries and, and sub industries starting around just helping companies be more adaptable and more resilient to climate and, and climate change, uh, and so um, I mean there it's it's going to be a massive op opportunity over the next twenty years for sure, uh, and and I would say that's going to be much more important than what administration is in what office in just about any country. Yeah, great, great point, Jan. All right, let's let's stick with you. We have a, a question from Curtis here. I think one of our future panelists on a future webinar. In terms of structure, do you recommend LLCs, LLPs, et cetera? What are the uh, advantages and disadvantages? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. I've always been involved in limited liability corporations, LLCs. And so certainly the, uh, well, the LL, the limited liability in there, uh, it, um, it limits the liability of the owners of the corporation. That's why it's called a limited liability cor corporation. Uh, they do, uh, those are fairly straightforward to set up, uh, easy to manage, but they then do, they have some certain tax implications. In the United States, if you're the owner of a limited liability corporation, depending on how you structure, uh, structure, structure the taxes, the tax, the profits flow back to the owners and the owners pay taxes on their personal income re returns. Uh, and that can get a little bit complicated. So then there are other forms. Um, I think LLPs, I'll be honest, I've never heard of a weather company being an LLP. They're usually then, again, by US tax law, they're an S corp or, uh, or a C corp. Um, as a small company, a lot of uh, the decision around the company is how much complexity do you wanna have around uh, regulatory filings and tax filings and things like that. LLCs are really straightforward, easy to get started. I do know there's quite a few companies that start as LLCs and as they grow, they, they do the necessary work to become a different type of corporation. If you are going to uh, seek venture capital, um, it's best not to be an LLC uh, because um, it just, it gets complicated um, for, for different reasons, at least in, in, in the United States. Okay, thanks, Jan, that's great. Uh, we'll stick with you here. A question from Andre. Uh, global markets can provide market security for VCs, but what do you think about bespoke services which have more value, but at regional or local levels? Yeah, so I think that speaks, that question speaks to a little bit of my last slide, which was it depends on like how you wanna fund your model, uh, how you wanna fund your business. Um, so the reason Alan mentioned a global application is you know, in an ideal world for a venture capitalist, they're going to put in a relatively small amount of money, get a large stake in the company, and then that company is going to be sold for billions of dollars. Uh, and um, and that just as I mentioned, the benefit that uh, you gain from seeking uh, venture funding is you get to scale really quickly uh, and you get to protect market share or grow market share but before others do. So in terms then of, uh, of more bespoke services, you know, you don't have to seek venture capital if you think you have a good business and maybe the market isn't that large. There are other ways to, to be successful. Um, and so, uh, again, there are also very large markets, um, you know, depending on where, where you're located or, or what market you are uh, pursuing, you don't have to have a global view for sure. Um, so if you, if you can make it successful and, uh, and earn a living from it, I, I would say go for it. It's, it's all good. Okay, thanks. Yes, that's good. Good encouragement, I think. So, Alan, let's got a, we've got a question here for you. What about crowdfunding as a means of starting up your business? Well, there are various forms of crowdfunding. Um, obviously, you can have crowdfunding to um, promote a product, get people to buy it before you've actually built it. 
um, which provides the capital for you to manufacture it. Um, um, the benefits to the customer are that they get it before anybody else. Uh, and hopefully it works and they promote it on social media uh, and you can start a business very well that way. <clears throat> I don't know whether you are actually asking about equity crowdfunding, which is something different, which is basically um, putting your investment opportunity up on a, on a crowdfunding platform um, and inviting kind of members of the public to, um, or members of the, the platform to, to invest in the equity of the business. Um, I think that can work well. Uh, there are two successful companies in the UK that do that, Cedars and Crowdcube, uh, and they have raised hundreds of millions um, for lots of companies in the past few years. I think one of the drawbacks um, of crowdfunding if you're a, an entrepreneur is that they won't put a proposition up on the platform unless you uh, have got some traction already in the in the round so you'd need to have raised at least I don't know between 30 and 50 percent of the round from your own sources uh, before they will risk putting it up on on the platform so you couldn't raise 100 percent of a round through through crowdfunding all right fantastic uh, fantastic Alan another question that's related more to revenue uh, proper, I think, is are there kind of revenue targets one needs to have in order to attract VC investment? Well, I think if you're looking at a um, yeah. software, software as a service, as a service business, um, then the magic figure is 100,000 either dollars or pounds of monthly recurring revenue. Um, I think once you get to that, uh, size, then you start to interest, uh, you know, this, the players in seed rounds and, and uh, small series A rounds. Um, then obviously the bigger boys would be looking at, uh, you know, a million monthly recurring revenue, which is obviously quite a substantial business by that point. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Jan, we've got a few more questions for you from the uh, the audience. The next one, I think quite interesting from Kevin here is, what are your thoughts on forensic meteorology and its need for use by insurance providers when determining if a claim is weather related? Is it viable as a main feature for your startup business? Sure, great question. So <clears throat> I guess uh, I will uh, delineate that forensic meteorology, in my mind, uh, is the application of meteorology in the legal field. Uh, this question was specifically to insurance. Um, I do think that um, certainly the use of meteorological data by insurance providers uh, obviously creates value for them. And I guess the question in terms of whether it's viable or not is the degree to which the processes can be automated and be done via a software as a service type type model, which is to say, so this is where I don't know enough about uh, like what actually happens when an insurance provider needs to use forensic meteorology to verify if an event occurred or not. Uh, but certainly if there are ways of automating that process uh, and uh, doing the two things that create value, which is save time and save money, um, then there certainly is, is a viable business there. Okay, excellent. Yeah, here's another really interesting one, I think, for parts of the globe where we might be a little bit data poor. So the, the question is, is it possible to build a weather business with satellite data, model outputs, reanalyses where observation data are either not available or very expensive? The short answer is yes, because I know they exist today. Uh, <laughs> uh, the longer answer is it's certainly, uh, it is possible. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful though, because there are some fields where whether it be a reanalysis data or a satellite data, it is an estimate of what actually happened. And depending on the uh, depending on the end use, it may not be good enough for it to be just an, an estimate, uh, which is, you know, I would say it depends on like what kind of error bands you're talking about. If you're trying to find the relationship between weather and some impact or something like that, the short answer is it's absolutely possible, um, and um, and there are. There are businesses today based on that idea. All right, fantastic. And and Jan, I'll, I'll note in the in the chat or comment 
question and answer window, sorry, that there's a, a note for you from Yonio that I think you just want to follow yep. up on kind of independently there. So uh, that's all that, we'll very, do. <laughs> great, great. So uh, Alan, question for you, how important is it to put your own money into a startup venture? Well, I think that's probably the first money that goes in, isn't it? Either in hard cash or in kind of sweat equity. Um, <clears throat> so it may, may be, you know, you're working for a period uh, when you're not getting paid. You know, you're writing the code or, or whatever that you need ready for launch. Um, you need to show commitment. Investors want to see commitment and that's, you know, working jolly hard working without pay uh, uh, and, and the rest. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty important. I mean, at later stages, uh, sometimes VCs will ask uh, the, the founder to co-invest, but clearly that's normally only if they've made money on, uh, you know, on previous businesses. If they don't have money, then, then obviously they can't invest. But, you know, for, you know, seasoned entrepreneurs <coughs> where this might be the second or third business, then yes, they will be asked to co-invest by the VC. Right. Yeah. Always easier, I think, to start if you have your own uh, cash reserves, right? That's the yeah. kind of bottom line there. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So, Jan, a uh, question for you here from Adolphus. Can you please address the possibility of having genuine agents to market your trending weather and climate products to agencies and governments in Africa. And, and although the question says in Africa, why don't we make it as broad as you want and just say in, uh, in any country, really? Sure, sure. So uh, in my prior experience, uh, I actually was part of a business where we used agents in countries all around the world. And one of the things that I learned is that the benefit that an agent gives you is one, they know the local language, they know the local business culture, uh, and uh, and generally speaking, they have a detailed knowledge of the local market in a way that, um, you know, as someone sitting in a desk in the United States, uh, I will never know. Uh, and so, um, so in terms of the possibility, uh, it's definitely a possibility. And if your goal is, um, if your goal is to penetrate very specific markets, very specific countries, uh, it is advisable then to try to find someone locally who can, who can help do that. The second part of the question talks about selling uh, products to agencies and governments, um, which um, again, my experience is selling to agencies and governments, it is really difficult. Uh, and, uh, and the reason is that there are normally very specific procurement rules and processes that, that you have to follow. Uh, and there's a certain scale of opportunity that it only makes sense that that only makes sense to pursue uh, agencies and, and governments with, um, but certainly there's no reason not to try to pursue the the role of using agents to sell into specific countries. All right, fantastic. So I think we have one more audience question here that, for you, Jan, a little more uh, theoretical in, in a sense, and I think the the, the the question being answered here is. Kind of with changing climate that we're seeing now and thinking about how numerical weather prediction models are, are somewhat based on uh, past conditions, right? How do you think the future of this industry uh, will, will be accurate? I think what they're really saying is how accurate do you think weather models will be uh, in the future? Sure, so, uh, so that's a great question. Uh, fundamentally, national uh, numerical weather prediction though is uh, it's based on physics. And um, so like the three, the three equations of atmospheric motion are based on force equals mass times acceleration. And what we're doing is acceleration equals force over mass. We're just trying to measure the accelerations of, of the atmosphere. So while the climate is changing, the physics is not. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't have any reason to expect that under uh, a changing climate, weather prediction is going to uh, the skill of weather prediction or our capabilities are going to change at all because it's, it's all based on fundamental pr principles. Okay, yeah, fantastic. So, so here's a question actually for both Jan and Alan. Uh, it comes from John again. He says, energy, agriculture, transport, and possibly health are some key areas where weather data is already being widely used, but where, does the, where do you see new opportunities arising as climate change progresses? Maybe Jan, we could start with you and then uh, Alan, I'll ask from your perspective, that's very same question. 
Yeah, so I, I mentioned it uh, once, which is in finance. Um, it's certainly starting to be used in terms of uh, green, green financing and uh, renewable energy financing, but also now uh, risk, uh, risk identification uh, as companies need to uh, understand what their what the risks are to, to their what climate risks exist for their business. That, that's definitely an emerging uh, an emerging trend. All right, Alan, what do you think about that? Yeah, sorry, I, I'm not sure I really have anything to to, to add to that. Um, yeah, there clearly is a very, very large pool of capital, um, you know, looking to to benefit from um, opportunities in, in climate change. Um, I mean, we see it in terms of, you know, new clean technologies coming along, you know, whether it's um, hydrogen, battery storage, or, or, you know, wind farms and solar farms. Obviously not much new there, but you know, you're getting incremental improvements in those technologies all the time, which are making them you know, super competitive with, with the you know, fossil fuels. Yeah, great, great. I, I think overall, right, there's not too many things that aren't affected by weather and or climate. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. So, um, all right, we have, a, an, a, I think, a really interesting question here from, from Robert. I've, so I've been in both academia and, and business, so I have my thoughts here. But Jan, is there an academic uh, business culture gap within meteorology? And if so, how would you suggest we navigate it? I guess, Sheldon, I'm going to be curious on what your answer is to this. But uh, so is there a gap? Sh sure, there, there's definitely a gap. Um, and I think it's best to find, um, well, the way I think of it is, uh, that you can't let perfect hinder progress. And what I mean by that is uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, from the academic standpoint, when conducting research, uh, you want to find, you know, the best possible answer or confirm your hypothesis in the best possible way, no matter how much time it takes to, to do that. And I think that in the, on the business side or the, the, the private side, um, you can't wait for perfect uh, because you'll never get there. Um, and that as, uh, again, our motivation is, is different than, than the academic environment. Uh, and our reason for being is different than the academic environment. Um, and so that there ends up being, uh, there ends up being a gap just in the way that you get from A to B when you're trying to solve, uh, solve a particular problem. Um, I would also say though, that there is, there's a gap that exists in that uh, there are certainly commercial companies that make claims that as a scientist, I kind of have a hard time understanding how they make that claim. And that definitely creates uh, a gap as well in the sense that um, someone on the academic side of, of the science uh, sees those claims, uh, questions them and sort of associates that behavior across all of the private sector. And um, like, and I'll say like here at Prescient Weather, uh, the work, the, the founders and myself were all, uh, um, we were trained as scientists and we execute the scientific process in the development of, of our products and in the information that we provide. And we, we actually execute with, with a very high standard. And so I think one way of, of navigating it is um, just making sure that, uh, you know, that folks in the private sector understand the, the, um, motivations of the academic side and, and from the academic side to understand that not everyone uh, is um, aligned with the companies that make potentially uh, difficult or impossible claims as well. Yeah, I, I think those are exactly right, Jan. The other thing maybe I would add from, from my experience is I, I think at the end of the day, whether you're in academia or it, let's include government here or, or private sector, we all kind of want to do the same thing, right? We want to protect life, property, our planet, the humans and animals that kind of live on it, but uh, we also typically do what we measure, right? And so for the academics, they want to publish and get grants. And in the private sector, we want to create products or hardware and sell that, right? And government has their own set of, uh, of kind of metrics that they're looking at. So I think a key way to, to is it's exactly what you say, look at the motivations of each of the groups and, and definitely recognize that we're all 
in the same rowboat, uh, but maybe we have slightly different oars, right? But it's okay. We can we can speak slightly different languages, but but uh, but we should speak. And there's a lot of I think there's a lot of potential benefits we can get when we cross these sectors that one particular sector on their own just doesn't uh, doesn't have the capability to to, to push the. The final solution forward. So, uh, I definitely say go for it. Right? It's a it's a, a really interesting thing to to try and bridge. So, um, okay. So we have a couple of questions here that are are kind of the same. So I'm just going to paraphrase them. Uh, I think this is a good kind of going away question uh, for us. Uh, so for both Jan and Alan, really, what is the the single most important thing you'd say to anyone who's looking to to start a new Wes or weather business today? Uh, make sure that the problem you think you're going to solve actually has value in the in the eyes of the customer and make sure the customer has that problem. So I again, I like to say uh, it does me no good to sit around the table with other people and talk about what would be nice for the customers to have. The only thing that makes sense is to talk to customers and figure out what they need. All right, Alan, uh, same question to you, but maybe from a slightly different perspective, obviously. Yeah, I think probably to uh, learn how other people have done it, really. Um, so, you know, get, get some people around you, whether it's mentors or advisors people have got experience um, earned the spurs uh, and have gone through the both the pain and the joy, and the joy. of, of, of um, a successful business. I think that's prob probably what I'd leave you with. <clears throat> yeah, perfect. Uh, per thanks for that. So Ian, can you throw up the, the kind of uh, going out slide here so everybody will have the correct email? All right, so there we see it at the bottom. So look, just uh, to conclude here, I wanna thank everybody for your time. Hopefully we got to almost all of the questions. If you have some extra ones, uh, throw them in at the end. And there's a couple of here that we just didn't have quite the time to get to that the panelists will take a look at, but really just wanna thank you all again very much for joining us today and hope you gained some useful insights into how you can go about starting and funding a business focused on the weather sector. So before we leave, let me plug our second webinar in the series. It will take place in January and we can reveal it will be about opportunities for those in the weather sector associated with the development of electric and autonomous vehicles. So in conclusion, if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists that you just uh, haven't thought of yet, please email them to us at ian at mediageneration.co.uk and uh, this information uh, for the uh, the overall webinar is being recorded and will be made available to everybody uh, after the fact. So again, thank you very much. We hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and hope to see you in January at our second webinar. So with that, I will sign off and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>